Title of Limit Loren, back to talk to you about limits of transcendental functions. I just ate a Wookiee, and I'll tell you, it was a little chewy. <laughs> First vocabulary term is a transcendental function. That's a function which is not an algebraic function. In other words, it's a function which transcends, i.e. cannot be expressed in terms of algebra. Examples of transcendental functions include the exponential function, the trigonometric functions, and the inverse functions of both. Just know that a transcendental function is basically just trig functions and then any exponential functions or log functions. Limits of transcendental functions. This says let C be a real number in the domain of the given transcendental function. So so this says the limit as x approaches c of some transcendental function in terms of x. To find the limit, all you have to do is take that c and plug it in for x. That's all this says. So anytime you have a transcendental function, an exponential function or a uh, trig function, just take that c value, plug it in the function for x, and then simplify and you end up getting your limit. That's it. Theorem 1.9, special limits. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equals 1, and the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x equals 0. Know these two limits. They are special limits, and we can talk about them later. Also note that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 2x over 2x equals 1. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 3x over 3x equals 1. As long as whatever this is is the same as whatever this is, your limit as x approaches 0 is going to equal 1. Similarly, down here, the limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine x equals 1. The limit as x approaches 0 of 2x over sine of 2x equals 1. Whether it's this way or the reciprocal, as long as this is the same as this, and it's the limit as x approaches 0, it equals 1. Now, we talked about this last time, but let's review. When evaluating a limit, always start by plugging it in. Always start by taking that c value and plugging it in the function for x. If you get a number, boom, you're done. You got your answer. If you get an indeterminate form, like 0 over 0, you need to try to simplify it by factoring and canceling, rationalizing the radical expression, getting a common denominator, using special limits, multiplying by a form of 1, or if all else fails, you can make a table of values and or graph. We're not to this yet when you get a number over 0, so you won't have to worry about that yet. Fear is the path of the dark side. Let me show you the way. It's example time. Example one says find the following limits. So we have the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over seven x. So remember, always start by plugging it in. We're gonna plug in zero. Sine of zero is gonna give you zero. Seven times zero is gonna give you zero. This is an indeterminate form, so we need to go back and see if we can simplify this somehow. So we're gonna change this instead of the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over seven x. We're gonna take one seventh out. We're gonna factor out a one seventh, and we take one seventh times sine of x over x. Now we know the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equals 1. So then all we have to do is use the scalar multiple rule and just take that 1 and multiply it by the multiple, your constant, 1 7th, and then we get our limit. Part B, it says find the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of cosine of x over cotangent x. Now, first, try substituting. So we take pi over 2, plug it in for x here and here. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Cotangent of pi over 2 is 0. So we get 0 over 0. That is an indeterminate form. We must then go back and try to simplify this somehow using the techniques from our flowchart. So I'm going to separate this. So instead of writing it like this, I'm going to write it as the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of cosine of x times 1 over cotangent x. 1 over over cotangent of x is the same thing as just tangent of x, right? Now that we have tangent of x times cosine of x, I can rewrite tangent of x as sine of x over cosine of x. And you can see here that the cosines of x are going to cancel out. I can then rewrite my whole limit as the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of sine of x. I can take that pi over 2, plug it in for x, and now simplify. I end up getting 1 is the limit of my function. Ray is stupid and I hate her and I didn't even want her to be on my side anyway. You try! So first, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine squared x, you can rewrite as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x squared. These two things mean the same thing. A lot of people run into trouble with this. They're like, what do I square? It's just sine of x squared. These mean the same thing. Now what I can do is just take that 0, plug it in for x. Sine of 0 is just 0, and 0 squared is 0. Now because it's not 0 over 0, it's just 0, that's my answer. That's my limit. Now here, the limit as x approaches 0 of tangent of x over x, I try to plug it in first. That's what you always try to do first first and I get 0 over 0, that would be an indeterminate form. So I have to go back and use one of my techniques to try to simplify this a little bit. Let's first try to rewrite it as tan x times 1 over x. And now we can write this tan x as sine of x over cosine of x. Now, 
How can I simplify this further? I could multiply this out and it becomes sine of x over x times cosine of x. And then I could separate that because I'm trying to get sine of x over x, the special limit. Now, all I have to do is use my product property, which says I take the limit as x approaches zero of this. And then I take the limit as x approaches zero of this and multiply those two limits together. So we know the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x is just one. And then the limit as x approaches zero of one over over cosine of x, plug in the zero for x, and you get one, so you get one over one. So one times one gives you one. Now example two says the limit as x approaches pi of x times secant x. So what I do always first is plug in my c value for the x. So I plug in pi for each of the x's. If I plug in pi here, I just get pi. Over here, if I plug in pi for the secant of x, I get secant of pi, which is negative one. And negative one times pi gives me negative pi. And that would be my limit. Here, I plug in zero for each of the t's and simplify, I end up getting zero over zero. Because that's an indeterminate form, what I must do is go back and try to simplify this using one of my techniques. Now, anytime you see like sine of something over something like that, you know that you wanna use the special limit. I wanna get sine of four t over four t. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually multiply the numerator and denominator by four. The reason I'm gonna do this is because the commutative property allows me to switch this three and four. So I get sine of four t times four over four t times three. These two things mean the exact same thing. It doesn't matter whether I multiply three times t times four or four times t times three. Either way, these all come out to 12t. So you can reorder it however you want. The reason I reorder it like this is now I can see that the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 4t over 4t is gonna equal one, right? That's one of my special limits. And if this equals one, then this, you just use the scalar multiple rule and multiply this times one, and you get 4 thirds times one, which is 4 thirds. Lastly, down here, I have the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine of x, and that's cubed all over x. As you can see, when you plug in zero, I end up getting an indeterminate form, which I then have to go back and simplify somehow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to rewrite this as one minus cosine of x over x times one minus cosine x squared. This times one minus cosine of x gives you one minus cosine of x cubed. The reason I do that is because I saw one minus cosine of x over x. So I wanna to try to get this by itself somewhere in the function so that I can use my special limit. So I take the limit of each of these. I know the limit as x approaches zero of this guy is going to equal zero and the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine of x squared. I can actually plug in zero here and I get cosine of zero is one. So one minus one squared is going to give you zero. So zero times zero gives you zero. <laughs>
I plug in these values for X in this function and I end up getting a number that looks like it is approaching a Y value of two. So again, I see a limit as X approaches zero of this function looks like it's approaching two. To be sure, I use analytic methods. I take this two out, put it out front. And the reason I do that is because I can see the limit as X approaches zero of this function right here is going to give me one because that's a special limit. And then using the scalar multiple rule, I can just take that one that this becomes and multiply it by the two and I get a limit of two. So that checks out. Example four, we're doing the same thing. We're evaluating limits. And when you evaluate limits, you always start with the same thing. We always start by substitution. So we take this negative one, plug it in for each of the X's, and then we simplify and we end up getting negative E to the negative first or negative one over E. Part B, we have the limit as X approaches E of ln of X cubed. Now you could either plug in this E directly here, or you could see first that using the properties of logs, we can just take this three and move it out front of the log. So you're taking the log of something raised to a power, you can take that power and move it out front. So I'm gonna do that and it makes this problem a little easier. Take this E, plug it in, and the ln of E we know is one. So one times three then is gonna give you three. Okay, part C says the limit as X approaches zero of E to the negative X of sine pi X. Then again, start with substitution, take that zero, plug it in for each of the X's. Simplify E to the zero power is gonna be one. And then sine of pi times zero is just gonna be sine of zero, which is zero. And so one times zero gives you zero. Over here, again, take that one, plug it in for each of the X's. LN of two times one is LN of two. And then E to the first is just E. <laughs> Okay, so again, anytime you are evaluating a limit, the first thing you should do is try plugging it in. So we're gonna take that C value, plug it in for X into the function. And once we simplify that, we get E plus zero, which turns out to be E, right? Because the LN of one is zero. Over here, we again have a natural log of X to some power, and we can use the power property to bring that four out front and multiply it to the two times ln of x. We can then take that e, plug it in, and ln of e is gonna become one, and one times two gives you two, times four gives you eight. Uh, down here, I am again going to plug in my one for each of the x's, and I get ln of one over e to the one. That becomes ln of e to the negative first power. And remember, when you take natural log of something to an exponent, we take that negative one, move it out front. So that way we have negative one times ln of e, which is just negative one times one, or negative one. So example five, we're still evaluating limits. We have the limit as X approaches zero of this function right here. We always try to use substitution first. So I'm gonna take zero, plug it in for each of the X's. When I simplify, I end up getting two minus two over two minus two, which is zero over zero. That's an indeterminate form. Because I got an indeterminate form, I must go back to this function and try to simplify this somehow in order to get an actual limit. So what I'm gonna do, there's nothing you could really factor out in the numerator and denominator besides two. I mean, you could do that, but it still leaves the E to the X's, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by a form of one. I'm going to multiply by e to the negative x over e to the negative x. Now the reason I do that is because when I multiply the numerator, I'm just going to leave it as two minus two e to the negative x times e to the negative x. In the denominator, I'm going to actually distribute it. When I distribute this, e to the negative x times e to the x, they cancel out. And then when I multiply this e to the negative x times negative two, I get negative two e to the negative x. The reason I did that is because now you see that these are actually going to cancel out. They are the same. When when I do that, these cancel out and I get the limit as X approaches zero of E to the negative X. So I plug in that zero for X and E to the negative zero or E to the zero is just one. Down here, same thing. I'm gonna plug in zero for X. And when I do, I end up getting zero over zero. That would be an indeterminate form. So in order to work with that, I'm going to have to try to get something to cancel out. Is there anything I factor? Yeah, actually, this is a difference of squares, believe it or not. I can factor this into E to the X plus one times E to the X minus one. And then you see that E to the X minus ones are going to cancel out. And I'm left with four times E to the X plus one. I can then take that zero, plug it in for X, simplify, and I get four times times two, which is eight. So again, always try to plug it in first. I take the negative four, plug it in for each of the X's, simplify, and I end up getting zero over zero. Indeterminate form. So I must go back and try to simplify this. Is there anything I can factor? Yes, I can actually factor this denominator. This is a difference of squares, which factors into X plus four times X minus four. The X plus fours are gonna cancel out, and I'm left with the limit as X approaches negative four of ln of X plus six over X minus four. I then plug in negative four for each of the X's, I simplify and I end up getting ln of two over negative eight.